Before going to sleep, I would like to read you a story. The story is called Don't Predict the Future, Invent It. It's a story about special glasses. And these glasses are special because they make inventing your future not only possible, but inevitable. So you want to hear it? Fantastic. When you dream, you feel as one of the characters of your dream story, because this is who you think you are in what you believe is real. And then you wake up into the real world. But what is the real world? If I take my first pair of glasses and see the world is flat, I won't go too far in the ocean because I'm afraid of the unknown. What if I fall down? Is this fear real? With these glasses, it is terrifying. And when scientists fir first presented the Earth as a sphere turning around the sun, there was great surprise and consternation. The whole idea was obviously absurd. But even for a notion of what is real, nothing is written in stone. To get it right, tweaking the picture wasn't enough. We had to think differently. Of course, from our standpoint, it's easy to look back and see the mistakes that were made. These glasses were made by young humanity with young knowledge. And it may look childish to us, but back then, it was all they had. It was the infancy of humanity. And suddenly, we saw the importance of getting the right picture. An incorrect picture was a present we couldn't even suspect existed. A correct picture broadens the understandable and transmutes the impossible into possible. <coughs> to cure ignorance, we had to invent something in which opinions could be questioned and results checked on. Reason became, became the answer to superstition. Man had invented science. And this is how the second pair of glasses came to birth. By the end of the 19th century, the real world was a great machine made of matter, absolute space, evolving through absolute time. We found security in knowing that natural laws could be understood. We found wealth in using them to our advantage. These glasses seem perfect. Superstition had lost, science had won. Let's have a look on how we may live with these glasses. As a separate piece of the mechanism, I go to an assembly line school and memorize the rules of how this world works. I exchange time for money. This is how I can buy the things I want. I want things, some because I need them to survive, but some because I, I love the way they make me feel. As I feel something is missing in me, I assume I have some kind of defect. And I may be convinced that this defect makes me ugly inside, leaving me with shame, guilt, and not being good enough. I am always busy seeking how to scratch my itch, but pleasure is short-lived and happiness is always outside of me in the future. Me often comes before we, and we live as cold-hearted robots. Mechanical glasses, mechanical desires, mechanical possibilities, mechanical society. A society in which no one is happy and life sucks. Sounds a lot like adolescence to me. But is there a problem with these glasses? I forgot to put the slide of the mechanical. Yeah, yeah, there is a problem, and we've known it for more than a century now. Our notion of reality was severely challenged when we discovered that time and space were not absolute. Relativity told us, well, they were relative. We were challenged again when we discovered that matter was not made of matter, but of energy. And this energy came in specific quantities, hence the name quantum physics. That's mechanically strange. Nothing there reflects the behavior of a machine. When faced with this puzzle, physicists gather and decide not to decide on what it means. 
they chose to stay focused on the calculation. But the more we explored, the less reality looked like a machine, and the more limitations became apparent, our own flat earth syndrome. The, mechanic, the mechanical picture has lost its legitimacy as a worldview. Sir James Lighthill, doesn't work or what? Sir James Lighthill, one of Newton's successor at the prestigious Lucasian chair, made the final killing with this apology as science having misled the educated people. Great. So now we know what reality isn't. It's not a machine. But what it is remained a mystery for a long time, until David Bohm came along. David Bohm was a physicist who understood something was wrong with the basic picture. On one hand, quantum theory shows that particles may instantly influence one another across vast distances. On the other hand, relativity says no signal can go faster than light. There is a bug somewhere. And Einstein said about solving the puzzle, if someone can do it, then it will be Bohm. And he did. Here's what we came up with. No need for communication between the particles, he said, because there is no separation. The universe is one, indivisible whole. Separation is an illusion. The physical is a continuous dance of particles emerging and going back to an immense vast field of energy. The world was not just created a long time ago, it is also being created right now, unfolding moment by moment. The physical is a projection of a vast domain of energy he calls the implicate order. Oh, and by the way, Bohm also believed space-time is created by us. Um, okay, what does that mean? If you go to sleep tonight and dream about being in this room, you're not really here, you're in a projection of it. You have created space-time and projected it as a place in which you play out your dream. And although you exist in it as a separate being, you know it's all one indivisible thing. And in his past years, Bohm worked with a group of people dissatisfied with the limitations of mainstream science. These scientists and engineers gathered under the name of the Life Physics Group. Through technology-assisted means, they have deciphered how the implicate order works, why, and what the rules are. They call this reality idiomaterial, meaning it is matter and thought at the same time, and we cannot tell it apart. Thoughts indeed contribute to shaping what we call physical reality. And here comes the special glasses. Seeing the world as a dream environment in which thought matter and so we can learn to use them to our advantage. As we think about something, it affects the way we feel and what happens in the collective unfoldment. What we put out as thoughts comes back to us for us to experience in the physical world. Reality becomes a mirror for us to play out our illusions. And this actually makes sense on more levels than one. Instead of, li of living from the outside in and seeking what we want, we can live from the inside out and self-generate what we want and change the world with our unique energy. Gandhi said, be the change you want to, be, to see in the world. Well, here you go. Happiness becomes available right now when you know the ability to create will still be with you in the next moment. Fear and lack start to disappear from our inner lives. And as reality is a mirror, they also disappear from our external lives. And even though we can see it, we can act as if our thoughts matter. They do. Maybe this is what the wise ones called faith. And since the quality of our external lives is determined by the quality of our inner life, we may as well enjoy the whole thing. Enjoy, put joy in it. And as we learn that the external life is a reflection of the inner life, we may start to change the causes, which is inner, and start to take responsibility, the ability to respond. Finally, we have reached the adulthood of humanity. That's nice. But is there any real utility with this? Well, I've worked with these principles for a few years now, 
And I have helped private people, private institutions, public institutions solving their problems. That's what is possible with it. You can imagine solutions out of nowhere. And I truly believe rea realizing our creative nature is the fix humanity is looking for. These glasses are yours. You have earned them just by listening to this. Ignore or explore, the choice is yours. You are a sovereign entity after all. So now, time to go to sleep or to stay awake, if you like. In any case, I wish you sweet dreams. Thank you.